And so we're going to, the, to our next guest, and I have the honor to introduce one of my, uh, my first, uh, first mentors that took me in the baby steps in this movement, um, Andrea Carmen. Uh, she's from the Yaki Nation, has been a staff member of the International Indian Treaty Council, IITC, and became executive director in 1982. In 1987, she was one of the indigenous representatives invited to formally address the United Nations General Assembly for the first time in history of the UN Earth Summit plus five. In 2006, Andrea was a uh, rapporteur uh, for the UN Expert Seminar on Indigenous Peoples' Permanent Sovereignty uh, over Natural Resources and Their Relationship to Land. Uh, the first time an Indigenous woman was selected as a rapporteur for the UN Expert Seminar. Uh, in 2019, Andrea was selected by Indigenous peoples in the North America to serve as their representative on the new facilitative working group uh, for the UNFCCC, uh, Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform for its first three years. Um, Andrea, such a great uh, leadership role, fine white. Thank you so much for your leadership and welcome to the show. Please, Ghazali, um, help me run on with Andrea. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Carson. Um, yeah, full disclosure, I work a lot with Andrea um, on, on human rights, oceans. Um, what do I not work with Andrea on? Or IITC, of course. Uh, Andrea, first question, I think um, maybe a, a very important question. How are you? Because um, you and your husband uh, were infected by COVID-19. How are you doing right now? Um, from the Yaki Nation here in Tucson, Arizona. Um, thank you for your inquiry of, of our health. And I will happily report that thanks to traditional medicine and many uh, uh, ceremonies and prayers that were sent from all over the world, we are doing fine now. Uh, it was myself, my husband, my son, and my grandson. We all lived together and we all um, uh, were struck by, by the pandemic. Um, everyone knows, I think, that um, Arizona in the United States uh, is one of the global hotspots. Um, there are no more intensive care beds uh, left uh, in hospitals here. So uh, we are very lucky that we are able to use our traditional medicines um, to, to provide the healing that we need. I would say I'm maybe 95%, you know, better. My energy level is, is still, you know, affected, but um, I feel great. I'm working again, and um, I don't wish this disease on anybody. It's not like the cold or flu, like they say. It's, it's very different and distinct and very contagious. So I wanted to share um, some pictures if I have a chance to. You might have other questions for me. Um, but I think the impact of COVID-19 is having a strong impact on us understanding uh, where our governance needs to take us. Um, so if that's okay, I don't know if you have any other questions for me. Okay, great. Uh, let's see how I can do this. Um, Great. Um, we, we've been talking about the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it kind of made me smile what Les was, was saying, how, you know, I was there, of course, you know, for the adoption at the General Assembly and for many, many years since the 1980s and in the working group on Indigenous populations where we began to you know, work on, on the UN Declaration. That's where I met Elsa too. We were, we were lovely young ladies. Now we're lovely older ladies. Um, but um, I, I think it's really important. Um, uh, one thing that struck me is we, we were talking that night after it was adopted, none of us really realized that the initials were the drip because we called it the draft declaration for so long, so many years, we called it the draft deck, you know, for short. 
And I agree with what Les says, you know, probably Chief Willie Little Child would, you know, be outraged to, to hear it called the DRIP. So we say the UN Declaration, even though we know there are many declarations, but um, we've really been focusing, uh, especially in this time of, of a health crisis, you know, on the article on the right to health, because it has two very important aspects. Um, one is the preservation and protection and revitalization of our traditional medicines and our ways of healing, which also include all of the, the plants, animals, minerals that we've always used for healing, as well as that knowledge, including intergenerational knowledge transmission, but also the equal access um, to the healthcare provided by the states. And in many places like Kunayala, Navajo Reservation and others, um, this disparity has really been highlighted, you know, by the high death rates of, of the lack of healthcare uh, facilities that are there. Of course, it's a young lady gathering traditional medicines uh, and plants in California. Um, I need to do something here, sorry. This technology, I think, is uh, <laughs> is really a lesson for us. But I was talking to Les actually before uh, the program started about how the the COVID nineteen has forced us in a way to use this technology. But the the positive side is the access is there. Um, of course, we have in the UN Declaration the right the right to uh, free prior informed consent before toxic um, and hazardous materials are used in our community. But the, probably free prior informed consent is the right that is the least uh, recognized in the Declaration. And this is just our communities in the last year in Rio Yaqui because we are in both Arizona and Mexico, um, our our Yaqui homeland. Uh, with the spraying of the pesticides and then the burning of um, the pesticide-laden crops by the agribusiness growers that rent the land there. And the high rates of both cancer and asthma that are affecting uh, even our children, our elders. And this, of course, is one of the vulnerabilities that we're experiencing. Um, our elders, the guidance of our elders is really being re-looked at you know, in our nations. And this is Roberta Blacko. Many of you knew her, you know, many years ago. She's uh, passed on now, but she told us that coal is the liver of Mother Earth and has to stay in the earth for her to be healthy. And this not only, uh, I think, was discussing and reflecting on the impacts of fossil fuel burning on climate change, but also this is. Uh, the Navajo Nation uh, station, the coal-fired power plant, it just closed at the end of last year, mainly for economic reasons, not because of the many years of protests by the traditional people, but this is coal uh, burning on the Navajo reservation, again, causing asthma, causing cancer, causing contamination that has increased the health um, vulnerabilities of the Navajo or Diné peoples and uh, for many weeks, the Navajo Nation experienced the highest level of death rate per capita of any place in the United States. And everyone knows the United States is the first in the world. So this nation, uh, our indigenous peoples in the northern part of Arizona and New Mexico, um, organized their own relief efforts because uh, the government of the United States and even the Navajo Nation government uh, were very slow in getting food to, to uh, vulnerable families. Uh, this is Jareed Yazi, you might know her from the U.S. Sustainable Development Goals with the mask in front. Uh, she organized a lot of these efforts because another aspect that we're really seeing, and we talk about this when we talk about climate change, is uh, the erosion of our food sovereignty as well. So we're, we're not prepared with healthy foods to keep our health and resiliency up our immune systems, but also when when disasters strike, we don't have that capacity uh, to feed our communities. This is another example. Um, again, we're talking about implementation and revitalization of our traditional methods. This is a roadblock that was put in place um, by the Ogla Lakota on the Pine Ridge Reservation to prevent the entry of COVID-19, understanding 
the particular vulnerabilities of our communities. And rather than welcoming this effort, the state of South Dakota, the governor, threatened them with lawsuits and then took the case to the federal government of the United States in opposition of them exercising the treaty right to protect their peoples. Um, this is also South Dakota and, and many tribal nations are bringing together youth and elders um, as well as tribal government to talk about uh, crisis strategic plans that includes uh, ensuring that we have access to local foods when the next pandemic hits because the vulnerability and the fragility of this uh, corporate um, food distribution and production has been highlighted, I think, by the pandemic. Uh, establishing indigenous food sovereignty zones is very important um, and has uh, really increased in importance and awareness uh, among indigenous peoples of things we need to do, our own governance. Um, this is Hawaii, you know, where they're really stepping up uh, in the nation of Hawaii, um, their traditional food um, production to feed their own people so we're not dependent on food coming from outside. And lastly, this is my last picture. Um, we need to restore uh, and strengthen our nation-to-nation uh, -nation diplomacy and trade among indigenous peoples because if we're depending on the states, um, on the outside governments, uh, we're going to remain highly vulnerable. This is one of our young uh, IITC staff members. He's Hopi. He's taking uh, traditional seeds um, from the Tono Autumn Nation here in Tucson up to the Navajo Nation as part of our solidarity, you know, for supporting their, their food production. So um, this is a nation to nation relationship building, restoring the trade routes that we had in the past as well. And last of all, this is a poster from one of our indigenous women in North America. And it says fighting viruses, plagues, pandemics, and biological warfare since 1492. We have to remember that we, those of us on the panel, those of us that are listening, our nations, our peoples, are the descendants of those that, that knew how to survive and discovered how to survive, even though they threw all these things at us in the past. We can survive, we're survivors, and we have to look at our governance systems to incorporate um, right to health, including traditional health systems, food sovereignty, you know, and these other aspects so that we can be survivors um, today and into the future. So those are just some things I wanted to share that we're thinking about here in North America and in our nation of, of issues we need to address going forward to strengthen our resiliency. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea, for, for, for this uh, for this impression of um, the severity of COVID-19 in, in, uh, in North America, uh, particularly in Arizona and Navajo Nation. And, and um, you talked about diplomacy, because so we're always talking about diplomacy, Indians peoples to nations, or nation states. You, um, in the web series, you're the first one to, to bring in nation to nation, like Indians nation to Indians nation um, diplomacy. I'll, um, I would like to unpack that a little bit. Um, any, any lessons that you would like to bring to the international level and any thoughts or ideas from the international level that you would like to bring to the indigenous to indigenous nation uh, diplomacy? Well, I think one thing, because of course IITC was the first indigenous organization to have consultative status and, and now we're, we're so happy that indigenous peoples from around the world are all participating in such a range of important um, UN bodies. And I think that um, Rodian and others have, have brought this up as well and less that, you know, we're not only there because our rights are being violated and we have to be insistent that our rights be respected and upheld, but we also have a lot to contribute to these discussions. For example, now the value of local food production. Um, very high level of, of uh, food is supplied by family farmers, by small scale farmers, many of whom are indigenous peoples. And um, despite this, and the fact the UN recognizes this, there's very little support um, 
whether it be economic or policies or recognition of land and water rights uh, to support the, the food production of small producers, uh, which uh, is more necessary now than ever because, you know, here in the United States, you could see um, the meat packing plants, the, the, the chicken production plants, all of those were hotbeds of spreading of COVID-19 and really looking at local production, local growing, and we're working to reinstall um, the use of traditional seeds and begin to trade seeds like we always did, which is part of also resiliency to climate change. But we have to work at the international level, whether it's WIPO, the Convention on Biodiversity, the Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, the Local Communities Indigenous Peoples Platform to protect those seeds so that the biodiversity we have, our resiliency uh, to various climate conditions is not undermined by genetically modified seeds. So the relationship of what we're doing on the ground and what we have to insist on in the international arena and that persistence to make sure that we're always cross feeding what's happening locally, what our traditional knowledge holders um, are saying they need and then what we take to the United Nations has to be um, maintained and us offering our vision. I think that's what we're doing with the climate change work now. Finally, that's recognized the value of our traditional practices and ways of knowing for the world um, has finally been recognized. But you know, how many years did it take? We weren't even allowed to be in the nego in the room for negotiation to listen to it. You know, until the last couple of years. So um, I think this is important, making sure that we're taking uh, what our peoples on the local level, what do they need? What are they challenged with? What violations of their rights are they experiencing? But also what they choose to share based on free prior informed consent with the international arena, uh, because the survival of the planet is at stake right now. Um, I if you can, of course, Andrea, and if, if you want to, can you explain a little bit because uh, how you bridge the grassroots with the International Treaty Council has been around for, for a long time, um, general consultative status with ECOSOC, um, you know, and it's, it, it's not only human rights, climate change, like you said, uh, pesticides, chemical conventions. How do you include or involve the grassroots with the international level as IITC? Well, first of all, we prioritize, uh, as Les was saying, you know, constantly bringing in new generations of uh, indigenous leaders and spokespeoples. Uh, IITC is a representative organization. Our members are our affiliates and their nations, uh, networks, um, communities, organizations. We don't have individual members. And they tell us through our conferences, through the development of resolutions from food sovereignty conferences and other kinds of gatherings that we have, um, what they want us to say internationally. What are the issues they're concerned about? What are the obstacles that they're facing to the exercise of their rights? And we take that and those are our marching orders internationally. Then we also ensure and we're learning, you know, webinars and all that as another tool um, to bring that back then and say, okay, this is what happened. What now? What do we do now? And I think um, several of you that are on this, uh, on this webinar, um, went through trainings that International Indian Treaty Council. In fact, I feel like such an old lady, Ghazali, when I say, I trained your mother and then I changed <laughs> pretty soon I was I trained your grandmother. But you know, or, or to somebody, but you know, Carson and yourself and others, um, and Elsa's part of that process as well. I think the prioritization of sustainability of this movement has to be, we're bringing in um, new voices, um, new spokespeople,s new leaders, and making sure they have the tools they need um, to work at the international level, as well as the other levels that we need to work at. They're all part of the same movement, and um, it, it's very it's very important that we take that traditional knowledge or ways of knowing as a basis for our work. Our people are the experts 
not some people named by the UN or professors or anything. Our people are the wisdom holders that we need to uh, listen to for our marching orders in the international arena. Appreciate it, Andrea. Thank you so much for your time. Um, maybe you want to plug the, the upcoming webinar series, maybe, um, or something else you want to... Oh, sure. Yeah, we just finished... Um, uh, a, 10, a 10 webinar series on the rights of indigenous peoples in the COVID epidemic. And we're planning to have uh, a second series, uh, maybe shorter, um, less, less, maybe three or four, on what have we learned? What are the lessons that we've learned, which I've shared a little bit from, from our region, um, uh, from the COVID-19 epidemic? Um, you know, this is a this is a very very strong lesson, and we need to look at it. You know, and we need to say how how do we need to change the way we do our work, the way we work in our communities? What are we going to keep? What are we going to strengthen? What are we going to let go? And so I've I've already begun asking some of you, you know, to take part in that. And I think we're going to start that on August tenth. Whatever that Friday is, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but we'll put that out and and ask all of you to disseminate it and and some of you also to be on that to start to think about because we always say spiritually everything happens for a reason. This is a hard lesson we're learning right now. It's a hard lesson we're losing so many of our elders, you know. So does that mean we of the next generation need to step up? And, and accelerate the use of that knowledge that they left us, you know, what do we need to do? Um, and, and it's very interesting that Mother Nature is specifically tar- targeting the human family with this lesson. You know, this COVID-19 affects human beings, unlike climate change, which affects all living things. So this is a lesson for us as humans and as indigenous peoples. What is the lesson? What have we learned? What are we going to do different? So that's what we want to talk about. So think about that, everybody, and and, um, we'll let you know how you can take part. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, for your time and and for participating in in this webinar series. Um, I know up next is Elsa, um, so Carson, and I know she's very much looking forward to contributing to this conversation as well. So Carson, um, yeah, you can take it away, introduce her. (laughs) <laughs> First of all, thank you, Andrea, and thank you for your spirituality uh, in everything that you've just said. That was very uh, touching. Uh, all of us here are praying for you and your people, and personally, I'm forever grateful for your teachings and guidance, of course, continuing to all that's by the hands. Uh, we work hand in hand with Victor, whom you introduced me to. Uh, thank you so much.